Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Laundromat Millionaire Show. We think this is maybe one of our best episodes ever today. We think you're going to love it. But fair warning, we're talking laundromat insurance. So it's not actually the sexiest topic in the world. But the cool thing is, if you aren't aware, me and Carla launched our own insurance program recently, partnered with some rock star laundromat brokers out of New York in Larry Trapani and Joel Blitzer. They've become very good friends of ours. They are absolute rock stars, and we're going to cover everything from how to get great rates on your premiums, how to save money, how to make sure you're not underinsured, and all of the above. Why are rates tripling in the industry right now? Why are some insurance companies refusing to write policies altogether? At the end of the day, what in the world is happening in our industry when it comes to laundromat insurance? And let me tell you, we brought the two right guys to get the answers. But before we get into the episode, we do want to have a partner spotlight. And today we'd like to spotlight Aura Detergents. Um, Aura Detergents, based in New York, offer premium detergents that you can white label for your own store. So they save you a lot of money, but they work just as well as other premium detergents. So we highly recommend them. And if you go to laundromatmillionaire.com slash services page, You can also see that we have a 5% discount for new purchasers of Aura detergent. So we love their products and we think you will too. So definitely check that out. But let's get into insurance. I need to raise my limits on my four stores. I eat a laundromat premium so high. Um, There's actually something called social inflation. We all pay for it. Whether people think so or not, we all pay for it. So here's paying $40,000, absolutely nothing. You have to actually know what the words mean. All right. So Larry and Joel, welcome to the Laundromat Millionaire Show. We're so happy to have you here. Thank you. Great to be here. Thank you very much for having us. And and we're so proud to be uh, in a partnership with the Laundromat Millionaire Group. Yeah. So we have an exciting announcement. We'll, we'll, We'll jump right into that right off the bat. If If you didn't notice, we've posted on social media on uh, things like that, that we have a new partnership. And that is with Larry and Joel. I'll introduce them, Larry Trapani and Joel Blitzer. Uh, they are in New York and they are very experienced laundromat brokers, specifically, or insurance brokers, specifically in the laundromat industry. And correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but you uh been at this over 20 years each. And I think one of you told me at one point that you already actively insure over a thousand laundromats. Is that is that an accurate statement? Uh, that is correct. We insure over a thousand laundromats nationwide, yeah. and we've been doing it over 20 years. I, I, I've been in insurance since 1985, okay. uh, worked for insurance uh, companies, and I've been with the agency since 1989. Uh, but in maybe 2000 or so, uh, my next door neighbor, a mutual friend of ours, Brian Grell of Eastern Funding, introduced me to the laundromat industry and it's been growing ever since then and this has become our agency's uh, specialty over the years yeah so the reason i wanted to start with that is one to let people know if you aren't familiar you can go to our website right now laundromatmillionaire.com backslash insurance and get free quotes uh our, our insurance team over there with larry and joel will will take a look at your current policies and see if you're underinsured um, I think a lot, and we'll get into this in more detail, but just to give you a little bit of backstory, Carla and I, when we started Laundromat Millionaire, we're just trying to help laundromat owners however we could, right? Workshops, coaching, podcasts, books, whatever that looked like. And as the platform grew and we got what I call Laundromat Millionaire Nation, all of you listening today, uh, the, you know, our, our audience, our friends, our fellow laundromat owners, we realized there's a lot of other opportunity and a lot of need out there, whether it's you know, as you all know, we have Launder Boost uh, Marketing Company with our business partner, Brett. We have other partnerships that have come out with Hydro and Perfect Pour and Santa Wash and all these different things. And this is our next partnership that we're really excited about. So this podcast is educational. We're here to talk about a really hot topic, which is laundromat insurance um, and how to not be underinsured and where to save and when not to save and all the things. So we're going to drill down on all of that today. But we're just excited to uh, invite you in and to introduce you to our new business partners and very good friends. Uh, Larry doing a little name dropping over there with the uh, the powerful Brian Grell. 
If you don't know Brian Grell, I'm not sure you're in the laundromat industry. The originator of the zombie mat. Zombie mat slayer. <laughs> uh, so you probably know or at least have heard of Brian. Brian, I, I, unapologetically, Brian is one of my favorite human beings, let alone one of my favorite people in the laundromat industry. Just an incredibly genuine guy who just looks to serve and help others and each other and probably the biggest collaborator I've ever seen in my life. And the story goes that I uh, was talking to Brian Grell one day, uh, probably a year ago now, and telling him about our desire to build some kind of an insurance program and what that looked like. And not exactly sure, but I see a big, I see a big problem and big vacuum and a big need in the industry. And he gets very excited about telling me about his good friends. Uh, and he tells me about you all. And next thing you know, we're on a phone call. And I think I had told you, Larry, I said, if Brian Grell will vouch for you, that's enough for me. But let's have a chat anyways. <laughs> and next thing I know, Brian maybe undersold you. And he <laughs> sold you quite a bit. So to be clear, uh, because you guys are rock stars. And, you know, I can say that from a laundromat owner's perspective, because we have four stores here in Cincinnati and we've had policies with dozens Various of different companies, <laughs> uh, different brokers over the years. And quite frankly, most of them, if not all of them, left something to be desired. Um, and so very quickly, I could recognize how knowledgeable you guys were and as important to us in a partnership that your hearts are in the right place. So you having the knowledge and experience is one thing to have the heart of a servant and actually want to salt, bring bring value to the industry and solve a problem is a really big deal. So for those of listening back home, we don't approach these partnerships lightly. Um, we are honored to, if you don't know Larry and Joel, they're not new to the industry. They've been around forever, as I said, uh, but we're honored to launch a partnership and announce a partnership with them. But this episode today is really not about that. This is really about just addressing a significant problem in the industry today. And quite frankly, something that's kind of getting out of control. So moving forward, we're going to let you guys do a lot of the talking because you guys are the experts here. But before we jump into it, tell us a little bit about how you guys, each individually, because you have your own story, how did you get into the insurance brokerage game and then specifically laundromats? So I, I took the highest paying job out of college off a campus interview that was with a company called Aetna Life and Casualty Okay. Um, in, in their underwriting training program. Um, I was there five years, worked my way up to senior underwriter, and then Aetna was going through a lot of changes, and today it's called Travelers. Right. So okay. a company uh, most people have heard of. Yeah. Then I went to a smaller company called AIG, American International Group, which um, at the time was the world's largest insurance company uh, that nobody ever heard of um, because it was a big commercial carrier, government carrier that really did jumbo crazy type of insurance. Um, it didn't become a household name until 2007, eight, when the financial market went crazy and AIG was uh, too big to fail. Um, because it really controlled a lot of the financial markets, worldwide insurance, global stuff, government entities, all sorts of stuff. Um, most of the major corporations in the world had some sort of insurance come with AIG. So there I learned international insurance and risk management and all sorts of crazy stuff uh, that can be done other than the uh, you know simple piece of paper that most insurance companies issue. Um, became very familiar with product liability and international insurance and loss control and claim handling and actuarial and really everything that went into, you know, the insurance policy and controlling the risk. Um, I was there a bunch of years. Um, I was working with a large broker on Long Island who, uh, after doing a great deal for him with some big company he was working with, sat me to his office and said, you're not leaving the office until you come work for me. So that's how I went to uh, the brokerage side, worked there for a couple of years on large accounts and uh, a lot of other stuff. And then I had met Larry, we were talking uh, over time. Um, then. Over 20 years ago, I, I joined Larry. Uh, we basically changed this to the agency, and um, here we are 20-something years later doing fantastic. Wow. wow. Larry, before you jump in and tell your side of the story, uh, Joel, it, it caught me a little off guard, but in a good way. So you started at the back of the house. That has to be, if I understand you correctly, that has to be really helpful, and that explains why you're so knowledgeable, other than just years of experience. That has to be helpful to now be... I'm going to call it customer facing and be an actual yeah. broker for us laundromat owners. When, when we started back in the eighties and nineties, the insurance companies had intense training programs. They hired yeah. college graduates. Uh, we went to a year of training, uh, with, with Atner. I went to Harper, Connecticut for five weeks, lived at the school, the insurance school base that they had together with other people training. And you, you didn't come back to the office and let you squat a hundred on the test. 
Uh, it was very important. A lot of intense training back then. Everything was manual, so you had to be able to rate policies with books in front of you. Mm-hmm. It was you know very little computers to rely on back then. It was all gut. You had to learn the business, learn the risks, um, and really learned how the the companies you were dealing with worked. Wow. You had to know what a pro- you had to know what a product did and how it can fail and hurt somebody or uh, you know those type of issues. Um, and then AIG was just on a much bigger scale. Yeah. Um, Long Island is a hotbed for insurance agencies. There's a lot of you know, we live in a very populated area. There's a lot of insurance agencies on Long Island. Not so much as there was back then, but back then, every agency owner sent their child to an insurance company to get trained before coming back to work for their parents. It's very common, including Larry. Um, so so at one point, probably you know, 98% of the agencies on Long Island, the owners all work for insurance companies. It was just a normal progression back then because who else was going to train you better than the insurance company? Yeah. If I never worked on that side, I'd be a terrible insurance agent. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I didn't want to go that far, but you didn't. <laughs> uh, so, Larry, what's your? Sounds like you have a little bit different angle on this. Uh, my father and two other partners started the firm in the early '60s, uh, and he said to me, "If you want to come aboard, that's fine, but we want you to get experience working for another insurance company beforehand." So, uh, I worked for Travelers. And then I worked for CNA Insurance back when they were selling personal lines. And then I joined Brooks Waterburn in 1989. Wow. So so even though your dad owned the brokerage firm or agency, whatever, I'm probably not using the right terminology, he even recognized the value of working for these big companies. Absolutely. It gave me a, a good insurance background. Uh, you don't get that working on the agency side. For everybody listening at home, we'll we'll jump into the weeds in a minute here. But before we do, so if an agent were, let's say, 30 years old and just got into the insurance brokerage world in the last five to, let's call it eight years right out of college, what would their typical, I know we're not talking about a person, but what would their typical training look like? Like a brokerage firm would hire them and show them some videos and say, sit beside me on some calls and... I'm sure I'm sick. Is it just like that. online certification? Uh, yeah. Well, it's all, it's all, well, there's license, licensing and that can be done online. But unfortunately, in today's world, especially the, let's call the majority of agencies out there, especially the smaller ones, they're not training their employees to do insurance. They're in training them to sell. Oh. They're, they're about selling. They're not about actually the insurance part of it. Um, you know, getting your license, I hate to say it is easy. You can take courses online, you can pass a test, you can get your license. But it doesn't teach you insurance or any real world, you know, examples. Right. Um, so, I mean, especially like the the names that people see on TV, the progressive, the all states, the state farms. Yeah. Those are just in-house training systems for one insurance company on their words, their policy. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. But they don't know about the other 12, you know, forms of that policy that are out there. Right. Okay. Um, so when the insurance company trains you, they're training you on the policy, you break down the policy word by word, paragraph by paragraph. What does this mean? What's, you know, every, everything is covered until it's not when you get to the last, you know, 30 pages of the policy. So you have to actually know what the words mean. I mean, we have lawyers call us all the time that we know. They need to explain what this means to us mm-hmm. because it's written in insurance terminology, not in their standard contract language. Um, so, yeah, this, I mean, in today's world, yeah, they stick you in front of a computer. They give you online courses, um, recorded, occasionally live courses. But it's not the same as, you know, working in the business, especially at insurance companies. Um, and then, you know, I, I don't know if I could start today because I wouldn't learn what I learned back then. It's impossible. It's just possible. They teach you how to read a policy and that's so important. It's rare that an agent actually reads the policy and it can be really important. Joel was reading this policy from a guy in Texas that has about 15 locations. He found an exclusion that on the liability policy that excluded slip and falls. I mean, what else are you in for? So he was paying $40,000 for absolutely nothing. Wow. And that's where, with you all being a brokerage, like you're not just like, so State Farm sells State Farm insurance policies, right? Or Progressive sells Progressive insurance policies. So they just have theirs. With you all being a brokerage, you all are kind of like shopping around for the best policies to fit our needs. And so you really have to get into the weeds on that policy and know exactly what the verbiage means. And that's, I know, Joel, that's your specialty is you read those policies with like a fine tooth comb and you know exactly what that person's getting when they, 
when they get a policy from you. Right. So let, let's explain that. So we are independent insurance agents. We represent many insurance carriers, mm-hmm. and we can go to pretty much almost any insurance carrier on your behalf if, if, through what's called managing general agents or wholesalers mm-hmm. um, that deal with a lot of other companies. Um, there is a lot of carriers that just go through wholesalers, so we can go through to those. And then use your captive riders, and they're captive, all state, state farm, um, Geico to some extent. Um, and then there's quasi independent agents like Nationwide, who allows their agents to sell Nationwide and other companies. Um, and then there's the companies who fool you, like Geico, who only have auto insurance policies, but they say they sell everything. Um, and they actually farm those policies out to other carriers that you've never heard of. Hmm. Uh, and you'll obviously, you know, when you have us, you have us. You have a claim, you're calling Larry and myself, you're calling our office. We have a full time claim manager who's experienced in helping you word claims properly because once you say something to an insurance company it's recorded they record every word so when you call it and tell them something and they call and tell me something different i can't say oh she made a mistake he made a mistake here's what they really meant so they're independent you know we always say we work for you we don't work for the man (laughs) yeah and that's why we encourage our customers if you have a claim to call it into us first don't go to the insurance company first because if you misspeak, like Joel says, it's it, it, it's written in stone. Yeah. You can't go back on that. Yeah, that was one of the pers- first pieces of advice you gave us. And I've never had another broker tell me that. And I found that interesting because I've worked with quite a few. Mm-hmm. Um, I found that interesting right off the bat. Kind of jumped out at me. Something else that uh, we were surprised by is that if you're unhappy with your insurance policy, you can cancel at any time. You know how you sign for an annual policy? I think with a lot of things, like with your cell phone plan, you know, like, oh, I can't get out of that or I got to pay a lot of money. But insurance isn't that way, right? Can Are all policies you can cancel at any time? Some some policies that you buy have a three-month minimum. um, But I mean, you can still cancel them technically, but you're stuck with three months. But in general, in general, the majority of insurance policies, yes, you cancel at any time. Okay. Some of them might have have a small penalty to do that. um, But we wouldn't do that unless the savings was great enough to make up that difference. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Cause I know when we had you look at our policies and we ended up, you all found us some better policies and we had some, some issues where we weren't covered correctly or as fully as we needed to be. Um, you know, we, we canceled those policies and they just refunded. We had already paid some of the premiums and they just refunded the portion, you know, to make up that difference or whatever. So it was very easy and you all made it very easy. Would you like to make more money from your laundromat? Would you like those machines you're paying for? to have more turns per day? Do you offer wash, dry, fold services or pick up and delivery laundry services? If not, would you like to? Whether you do or not, we have an amazing opportunity for you in Cincinnati, Ohio. Yeah, you've probably heard about it, guys, but it's our wash, dry, fold, pick up and delivery workshop. And to answer your first question, yes, it is for drop off laundry, wash, dry, fold, and pick up and delivery. So if you're doing any of those things, this workshop is going to help you tremendously. But the truth is, we were pretty so-so laundromat owners and so-so successful until we launched Drop Off Laundry and Pick Up and Delivery. And being able to what I call optimize your laundromat to generate more profit and more revenue out of the existing facility, that's the key to taking your life from good to great, financially speaking, with laundromats. And that's what made us laundromat millionaires. You don't have to just listen to us. Listen to what some of our past attendees have to say about our Wash, Dry, Fold, Pick Up and Delivery Workshop in Cincinnati, Ohio. It was the best workshop I've attended in over 25 years. And what you guys have put together is nothing short of phenomenal. I think that you guys have put together both strategic and tactical systems that uh, will make an individual who wants to own the laundromat profitable within, within months, not years. Was the workshop worth the investment? Without a doubt, it was definitely worth the investment. Uh, so not only did we have two uh, very packed days uh, with uh, Dave and Carla and, and their team, uh, both uh, in the classroom and touring the facilities, uh, but we also came away uh, with this uh, extensive 100-page uh, handbook. And then after the uh, workshop was completed, I received a bunch of uh, electronic performers uh, and templates that uh, we've been able to use uh, since the workshop. Every day since the workshop, I've found myself referring back to 
uh, either those electronic tools or, or, or the handbook that we received. So, was it worth the investment? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. I cannot say that enough. This was such a blessing, and I am so very grateful that. Dave and Carla put this together and are sharing their knowledge and experience with others um, to have this to have this to grow their business and to become more successful. Thank you guys. So are you interested? Go to laundromatmillionaire.com to learn more and see where you can register. Um, I want to talk about in recent times, I know there have been insurance companies out there that have been refusing to insure laundromats. Can you all Talk to us about why that is. Why is this happening? She just opened this Sandora's box, didn't she? <laughs> we could talk about this for hours. Dude. Right. I know. I'm on the phone every day with clients answering this one question. Why are laundromat premiums so high? Uh, why did my insurance company stop writing them? I never had a claim and I run a great operation and I feel I'm being penalized for somebody else's mistakes. Well, that's kind of true, but... Basically, the insurance companies are not making money in the laundromat space for a lot of reasons. One of them are market conditions. You have hyperinflation going on. Uh, you have cost of wages going up. You have claims that are taking longer to settle. So five years ago, what was a $15,000 claim is now a $50,000 claim for the exact same claim. Uh, because is that because of inflation or is there other factors? There's quite a few factors, not just the inflation part. Inflation right. wasn't really affecting the insurance company, uh, you know, with laundromat per se, but everything else coupled together with it just, you know, made it, made it worse. Specific to laundromats, frankly, there are just more claims in the laundromat space than there were in the past. We are getting, uh, by far, the most frequent type of claim we get are the slip and falls. We get one or two of those a week. And imagine this, even if nothing happens on that claim, settle without pay, you're still paying the attorneys or the insurance companies are paying the attorneys five, ten thousand dollars to settle that claim. And your premiums might be two or three thousand a year for the liability part. So it's almost impossible for insurance companies to make money on that. Do you think in, in the last, it, this increase is because people are just more like litigious? Like everybody wants to like, I'll sue you. <laughs> yeah. So so just recently in the economic numbers that all the people that are you know much smarter than me talk about, um, there's actually something called social inflation. And social inflation is the number that's driven by, by uh, class action lawsuits, all the 800 attorneys, all the people saying, oh, look, there's a big neon sign. Let's go fall there and call a lawyer. And it's actually picking on the economic charts now. So it, it's even if it's you know half of one percent, that's half one percent of trillions of dollars in the economy. Mm -hmm. um, and it makes a huge difference. I mean, you know, you drive up and down some freeways, especially in Florida, nine out of ten billboards are eight hundred lawyer signs. Um, if you notice most class action suits are filed in very strange federal jurisdictions than, you know, Nebraska, Wisconsin, wherever they think there's a jury pool that's going to pay the money. Not necessarily where the business is located. So a lot of things are filed in federal court because they could find better, you know, jurisdictions for the lawyers to, you know, plead their case with people who have no sympathy for large corporations or, yeah, you know, or that. So they, that, that that's all adding to the thing. Lawyers are just, you know, smarter and they they use the system for the best of the benefit. They get paid and get paid for their clients, and we all pay for it, whether people think so or not. We all pay for it. So that makes sense. Why insurance companies are less willing to, I guess, insure laundromats. But we as laundromat owners, what can we do then to protect ourselves? So obviously, we're going to have this issue of even finding places that will insure us, and we're going to be paying these higher premiums. And I don't know how much we can do about that. But what can we do to protect ourselves from these like crazy lawsuits, these crazy slip and fall lawsuits that you're seeing? What do you recommend your clients do? Here are some, some, some tips that we recommend. Number one, Maintain a safe environment. If you have spills, make sure they're clean right away. Put those cones out. Clean the dryers. Maintain proper lighting. Fix the cracks in the sidewalk. If it snows, shovel, spread salt so people don't fall. Things like that. So you want to maintain a safe environment. Install a security system. 
have alarms, have cameras. And one of the tips we give clients is if there is an incident and it's caught on the camera, record that to a thumb drive and save it forever. Because we know eventually that'll be taped over. Sometimes it's 30 days, sometimes it's more. Uh, but the lawyers know that too. And they wait a year, two years to file a suit where they know you recorded over that incident. So if if you record that and put it on a, a thumb drive and save it, uh, you'll be protected, especially if they won't hurt all that much. Yeah, employee training is really important to train the employee that if they even think something happened or somebody complained about something, to call the manager and get that tape to see what's on there. And then two years from now, when you know the lawyer was calling, so Tuesday, 4 o'clock on January, you know, 19, whatever. And, and, you know, David Carl pulled a tape out. Well, here's my tape. Nobody was in the store at that time. So what, how does that work? If someone has a, let's, let's call it in theory, a a real slip and fall injury, um, but they don't report it to us. Like, like a lawsuit comes up two years from now at a thing. And we talked to the person that worked that day and nobody ever said anything about it. Is there any reporting, um, requirements, at least to us? How would we know? No, there's not. They can, they can, I mean, in New York, you have a three year statute of limitation. They can call you on day 364 with a, and here's a lawsuit. I fell in your store three years ago on Tuesday and uh, the floor was slippery. Prove I didn't. Wow. So it's on you to prove that it didn't happen. Well, it's on for your lawyer to depose them and hopefully, uh, you know, I mean, in my opinion, it always was if you were really hurt, you know, obviously the attendant's going to know about it because if you're hurt, I mean, enough to, Right. To be hurt, there's going to be a scene. Yeah. Number two, if you're really that hurt, you're not going to wait three years to call me and tell me about it. You're going to want your money now, yeah. especially to get paid for your medical bills. And I can tell you, you know, 99% of the ones that come in, I think are fraud. Yeah. <laughs> and, we, and, we, and we've seen great videos of fraudulent tries. <laughs> I bet. Um, we, we, would, we, we were just with a client this week talking about that because we were going over their loss history and, oh yeah, that one's fraud, that one's fraud. And we talked about some of the videos that they sent us that are just people trying to make it look like something happened. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but, the video, but, you know, <laughs> no, not great actors. Any, you know, any sensible human being that watches the video is going to realize that. Yeah. Yeah. So what about, and I, if you have anything else to add on that, feel free to jump so in. So I would say the take-homes there are make sure, obviously try to avoid any slip and falls truly happening by keeping your store clean. Right. But then to protect yourself from those fraudulent ones, video recordings, keep them for a long time, and then accident reports. So like having like a a system in place where your attendants fill out a form with a date, with a description, you know, maybe even have that person sign off on it and everything. So have that recording and then, yeah. and then keep that but, recording forever. There's nothing better than free. Ever heard that before? Well, it's not true. You know what your laundromat customers like even better than free? It's fast. That's right, they wanna save time more than they wanna save money in most cases. They want to get in and out of your laundromat as fast as possible, and they'll pay more for that experience. We're proof of that here in Cincinnati. That's why we added HM Company drain troughs into our newest store in Cincinnati. While they may never know why, your customers will love that your washers all drain better and faster than with old school drain pipes. As if that wasn't enough, every HM drain trough is made in the USA, so they ship in only a few weeks and everyone is custom made just for you and your project. If you want to provide your customers with a top of the industry experience in your store, then contact your distributor to order your HM company drain trough today or visit draintroughs.com. One other question I have on this subject before we move on, guys, is what about the business model side of things? Like when I think of like unattended, 24 open 24 hours. I know those are more expensive to ensure. Um, what are, I don't know that we're going to change our business model because of insurance, but what are the types of business models and the thought considerations for being more expensive to insure or maybe uninsurable in some situations? There's an old expression that the former coach of the football New York Giants used to say when he gave his team curfews, he says, Nothing good happens at 2.30 in the morning. <laughs> and I guess the insurance and, companies think that too. <laughs> too. Although I'm not sure Joel and I agree with that because the fire starts, at least there's somebody there to get people out or help put it out. 
True. Uh, yeah. But so I always make that debate with the insurance companies about 24 hours. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah we, have, we have very few fire claims for open laundromats. It's always at night when nobody's there. Hmm. That's interesting. What would cause those? Just uh, it's always electrical or or spontaneous combustion of garments, which we left. which we've seen quite a few times. Sure, I, I I actually just had another client that wasn't a laundromat. They were staining something and threw a rag in a garbage can, and we saw it all on camera. An hour later, all of a sudden, it starts smoking, smoking, and burned out half the warehouse. Really? So, and we know in dryers, people you know will take the hot stuff out of dryers, they'll throw it into a pile, and Walk away, they leave, and you know, laundry mess closed. It smolders, and then stores yeah. burn down. We, we've That's we've seen it happen numerous times. Okay, so following that train of thought for a minute, is it more expensive to insure a 24 hour store and or the same question with an unattended versus attended? Yes, and yes, and and the difference is getting greater. Uh, it's becoming a lot more expensive. Where five years ago it was a little more expensive, now it's a lot more expensive, but almost. Double. 24 hour and unattended are not looked at fondly by the insurance companies. Right. But cl- claims are different in different types of laundromats. Unattended laundromats, um, especially in very rural areas, see a lot of vandalism claims. Okay. And also in some places, see a lot of people use them as homeless shelters and places to sleep and use the bathroom, um, which makes the places not clean, which causes slip and falls. So there's different issues in different places in the country and different types of laundromats. Um, there's great 24 hour laundromats, there's great unattended laundromats. We know that, um, there's terrible attended laundromats. We know that. And there's fantastic attended laundromats. So, you know, it, it's, you know, like under any other business, you have good and you have bad and you have the mediocre. Yeah. So we, you know, all we can do is, you know, insurance agents and consultants is, um, educate and try to get people to keep clean, clean floors, clean stores. And, and, you know, hopefully nothing happens. So for a person getting into the laundromat industry and trying to decide what model they want to use, um, they need to weigh the cost of, okay, if I want to be 24 hours, is that worth the additional cost it's going to have on my insurance policies? And you'd be able to help them with that. Or if I want to be unattended, what additional cost? Like you can kind of look at, could you look at, here's your cost if you were to run an attended versus here's your cost versus unattended? Yeah, we do it all the time. Yeah. Um, next, I want to talk about uh, some common mistakes you'll see in policies, because I know you all did this for us, looking at our policies, and then you gave us a quote. What are some of the things people's, people come to you feeling like they have, they are fully insured, they are covered, and they missed things? <laughs> Let, 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 me see what, let me see what Larry's number one is now, if they what my number one is. Okay. <laughs> Uh, my number one is something called tenant improvements. So let's say you lease the space that you have your laundromat in. You don't own the building. You convert it from, uh, let's say it was a deli before, and you convert it to a laundromat. You put a couple hundred thousand dollars into the space besides the equipment. You are responsible for that. You may not own it once it's installed into the building, but you are responsible for 99% of the leases say that. So when we ask a client uh, about number of washers, number of dryers, we also ask them, did you do any renovations to the space and how much did it cost? Was you want to insure for that? And, and again, that's called tenant improvements. So basically someone could, if, if that wasn't in the policy, so like if I come to you, I fully insured all my equipment, those tenant improvements, those aren't mine anymore. And if I were to have a fire and everything burned down, I would just get money for that equipment. And if I lost all the water lines and electrical work and all that infrastructure that I put in, it wouldn't be covered, right? Is what you're saying happens? Exactly. For a 4,000 square foot laundromat, you could put over $200,000 worth of improvements into that space. That wouldn't even be covered. That's correct. Uh, Let me dig a little deeper here. Is it not covered because they didn't increase the coverage to, I feel like I'm using the word cover a lot, to cover the costs? Or is it a separate, uh, I'll use the word rider? Or what's the the mistake in not getting it covered? Just only covering, like, let's say I'm 900,000 in equipment, 200,000 in TI, tenant improvements. Is it because I just asked for 900,000 in coverage and I should have asked for 1.1? Correct. Okay. I'll just try, I'll just sharpen and then go back to Larry. 
the number one reason why people underinsure is because the bank asks for five hundred thousand, so I'm asking for five hundred thousand. Okay. They're only they're only getting insurance for the loan, not right. the cost of replacement. Uh, correct. Uh, something you guys brought up at the workshop, um, and we're referring to our wash, dry, fold, pickup, and delivery workshop. If you're not familiar with our partners, uh, Brett at Laundry Boost and and our insurance partners Larry and Joel, they come and speak at them, and you get access to them. So if you weren't aware, that's a part of the workshop. But one of the things you talked about there was the the need for um, to cover the cost of equipment, oh, you know, replacement not, cost. Not, and I found this really interesting because I like to think that, you know, I try to, I mean, I know I try to stay on top of things. And like you were talking about, I think an example you might have used, Joel, was even just a few years ago, you might have built a, let's call it a $1 million laundromat. And you could blink your eyes in two or three years and keep the same amount of coverage for two or three years. But if that place burned down and you had to replace all the equipment and the TI and all that, I mean, it's not crazy to think that like equipment costs are going up by 10, 15% a year in some cases. You could blink your eyes in two or three years and you need to increase your coverage by 30%. That was kind of mind blowing to me, even though it makes complete logical sense to me as a laundromat owner. So a typical conversation, Larry, and I had this week with a client meeting, um, you know, the first two minutes is always about the rising costs. It's horrible. How are we going to afford this? Oh, by the way, I need to raise my limits on my four stores. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or if they don't know, I guess is what I'm worried about that they that they have nine hundred thousand. They're like, yeah, I bought the equipment two years ago for nine hundred thousand dollars. That might be one point one two years later. And if the, and I guess what I'm saying is the owner didn't know, and a not you guys, but a, a broker that maybe wasn't as plugged into the industry didn't understand, and they just say, how much do you want for equipment coverage? And the broker is outside, you know, is not specializing in the laundromat industry. They say, "Well, Dave, how much do you want?" And you say, oh, nine hundred thousand." And they say, "Okay." And three years later, the place burns down, and I have nine hundred thousand, but it cost me one point three to rebuild. That's a very real thing to happen in like two years, and that's a little. That was a little. Uh, it rattled my cage. So you really need to assess your policies every year. Assess and adjust your policies every year. Is that what you all would recommend? Yes. And especially when you're buying a store, I mean, you're, you can't insure your goodwill, the money you pay for the name brand, all that stuff. But, you know, if you're buying a store that's 20 years old, that means you have 20 year old wiring, 20 year old piping. So the risk factor is even greater that something's going to happen to that store. I, I was talking to an electrician this week that does a lot of work. And he, and, and well, let's go back. We had three claims in the last two weeks for power surges where machine boards got blown out because now they're all electronic. You know, each, and that, those are, Forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars worth of just little boards to replace into the machines, and you know that's something that wasn't happening five years ago right. when the machines were still mechanical and had quarters in them. Um, so that's a lot of the you know stuff that's adding to the rising costs. And as an and that le and that led me to believe: are these stores being built improperly that they don't have power surge detectors, you know, on the main panel that is stopping this? Because I mean, if you're building a new store and spending a million dollars and Two hundred thousand dollars on you know power. Why isn't the electrician putting in a master surge protector to protect all of your fancy equipment? Yeah, and I guess I keep going back to if the owner doesn't understand these things, and I don't know that most laundromat owners would understand, or maybe it does not occur to them. And you're using a broker that isn't writing hundreds, if not thousands, of laundromat policies, and isn't always having these things reminded, then the, the broker is is going to do what they think is a good job and think that they're insuring you for that 900000 you want. They don't know any better. You don't know any better. And it's all the result of an owner can't possibly know everything. A broker can't possibly know everything. But if you're working with a broker that doesn't write many laundromat policies, this is not going to be top of mind every day. They're not going to be They don't know what the common claims are. It's not that right. these brokers are, you know... We've had brokers in the past that did not insure us properly, and it wasn't because they weren't trying to to give us everything we need. It's that they didn't know. They did. so, and, and we didn't know either. <laughs> what about, so there's definitely underinsuring and that you don't claim full replacement costs for everything you've done to the space. What about other things that you recommend either are added to a policy or maybe even a special type of policy for laundromat owners? Um, to have specifically for our industry. What about with being a commercial policy? Do you need a special policy for loss of business time while you're under construction? Do you need any special kind of policy or anything in there to help cover 
you know, different natural disasters. I don't know. What else do we need? Before we get into the business interruption, and I'll let Joel handle that, uh, one very basic thing that you should consider is have a high deductible, a $5,000 to $10,000 deductible. If you have a million dollars worth of equipment there, the $10,000 deductible is nothing. Mm-hmm. And the reason we suggest a high deductible is I don't want you to put in a small three four $4,000 claim because in the long run, the insurance companies will charge you more. So like have a higher deductible because the claims are going to make them increase your premium and you end up losing more money than you would have spent just to cover that yourself, basically. Exactly. Correct. Whenever a client calls me with a small claim, I, I use all my powers and all my skills and try and dissuade him to not put in that claim. A frequency of small claims to an insurance company is far worse than one big claim. Really? Over time. Over time, yes. Why is that? Okay, I got I to gotta dig. Because the small the small claims, you know, there's a cost to handle claims, whether it's on our side or the insurance company side. There's adjusters, there's appraisers, okay. um, there's, you know, financial people, there's all that stuff that go into handling a claim. So to handle a thousand dollar claim, you know, might cost them twenty five hundred dollars of expenses. Right. But to handle a, you know, hundred thousand dollar claim might only cost them ten thousand. So it's a lot co- more cost beneficial for them to handle big claims than small claims. Plus the insurance company looks at them as a a too much of a claim conscious type of person. They'd rather not do business with them. Yeah. And why why are you having multiple small claims? So eventually you're going to have a big one if you're having all these small ones. So business income, loss of business income um, is a limit on your policy specifically, usually on your property policy. Um, For something that happens to a direct physical loss to your business, very important words, direct physical loss. So anybody has been following along, the pandemic was not a direct physical loss to your property for insurance reasons. It was denied immediately because there was no direct physical loss. So direct physical loss could be a fire, can be vandalism, could be a car going through your laundromat, which somehow happens a lot. It does. Um, <laughs> but it could also be a fire two doors down, which closes you because a fire is covered on your policy. So if a fire, albeit not in your store, happened next door, but closed you down, that co- that's a direct physical to someone else that caused you damage. So that could be a business income claim also. Business so, income tra- traditionally is at least 50% of your sales. And I'm going to say on your book sales, we know everyone has on the books business. Um, we have seen um, people with not a lot of on the books business try to put business income claims in. And you can't have it both ways. You're either on the books or off the books when it comes to insurance companies. So you might have a million dollars of sales. If you're only showing 200,000 of them, that's all you can look at for business income is that 200000 So records are important in any business, of course, uh, especially if you're, you know, if you're playing with cash, you're depositing it properly, that's covered because you have bank records that you're depositing, and here, here it is. Mm-hmm. But if you're just taking the bags home and putting it in the basement, that's not going to be covered. There, too, didn't you mention something about, like, if someone were to steal my um, coin changer or whatever, like, I could get reimbursed for the price of the changer, but not for the money inside. Well, right. yeah, we don't know if it was we don't know if it was three thousand dollars worth of coins or dollar bills in that change or five hundred dollars when it was stolen. So cash is very hard to insure. Yeah, very hard. No one's sitting there at a store trying to break into a you know a change machine or a washing machine for ten dollars worth of quarters. Nobody has the patience. But we've definitely seen ATM machines taken away. Mm-hmm. We've definitely seen you know machines taken out, cash machines. Um, but at the end of the day, the reimbursement is really for the actual machinery, other than you know the cash that might have been in there. So any other um, common problems you see in people's policies? Anything else that you would recommend? I know, you. I know, Joel, you're a big, read your policies, read your policies. <laughs> well, Larry, Larry talked about the, uh, you know, improvements, betterments and all that stuff. My number one was going to be misclassification of policies. So part of the reason some carriers might have got out of the business is because as insurance carriers, as independent, they trust us to issue a policy properly for your business. I'm, you know, I'm their underwriter. Um, unfortunately, we've seen over the last couple of years a rash of people not issuing policies correctly with various insurance companies. So you are a laundromat. The class code is laundromat attended, period. But I might look at a policy from XYZ company out and, you know, sell what issued out there. And, oh, it says dry cleaning drop store or laundry pickup station. That class code entails you have no machinery and have no customers coming into the store all day long. And for some carriers, that rate might be 70% cheaper which also adds to the poor loss experience in that class of business when things are not classified properly. 
So one of the first things we do is read through the policy to make sure it's classified and, you know, properly. And then we go from there. Uh, Larry and I got a policy in today, a gentleman who owns two buildings in New York, laundromats in very different parts of New York. But I kept looking through the policy and I'm like, Larry, I don't see the laundromat covered. I know the name is on there. I know he owns the building and there's building coverage. I see no words that make me believe that the insurance company realizes that they are actually insuring a laundromat. That's, that's kind of one of the reasons that read to the laundromat, you know, crisis with insurance um, over the years. It took a long while to brew, but it did. Um, we knew, you know, insurance companies would know that eventually. Um, you know, when one agent does it, they can, you know, slap them on the wrist. But when other agents start doing it on a wholesale basis, because they see, they see someone else do it, and they only do one or two laundromats, so the insurance company never notices. So it, it took a while to, to brew with some insurance companies, but they're, they're with, with computers and technology and reports, um, you know, they're, they're getting better at figuring things out quicker. So if there were to have been a claim on that guy's laundromat and it had been classified wrong by his agent, what would, would it get covered or? Is it a definite, that's a definite maybe. Maybe. Chance of definite. Definite maybe. And I know that and was something you found on ours. We had a misclassification on our policy. Mm -hmm, we did. That's right. And one of the things that I would recommend to laundromat owners is to tell the truth on when you're making an application for insurance. The insurance companies now more than ever are looking to deny claims, not just in the laundromat space, but across the board. I don't know. How do I know that they're not lying, either intentionally, meaning classifying as a dry cleaner when I'm actually a laundromat because they can get me a cheaper rent? You want to sign an application, and most of what you say should be on the application. So it, the application will ask you how many claims ha, uh, did you have, and, it, and if it says none and you had three, you know, so there's something wrong there. Right. And that goes back to Joel pounding into us, read your policy. Like, <laughs> work with an experienced agent who you trust and who does this on a regular basis, and things aren't going to slip through the crack. But also don't work with, don't just shop around for different agents and brokerage firms and say, well, this one saved me 30%. Yeah, that, I guess in my mind at this point, I would say, wait a second, how did you save me 30%, right? Like that would almost, the fact that you can save me even 10%, especially in this environment, would maybe throw up a red flag and it wouldn't worry me. But I guess I'm also the, I told you guys this when we met, I'm the type of person that would rather be overinsured. I would rather pay extra to know that I'm not going to have an issue because I've had some claims, not big ones, but I've had some claims and they went smooth and I was grateful. And I know a bunch of coaching clients that have had nightmare scenarios and man, all you got to do is hear one. And these are not TV stories. These are real life stories of people losing hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it's not something to play around with to save yourself 1500 bucks. And it's not something to take lightly in the broker or the program you work with, because if they take it lightly, you may not know because you're not an expert. Right. Wow. So I wouldn't lie on a claim, but my thought is things change. And so I have a question like, how do we know when we change something in our business that it's an event we need to report to our insurance broker because we might need a change in our policy? Like for instance, if I go from, you know, attended to unattended or, or vice versa, I need to call my broker and adjust that. What if I have a laundromat and I decide to add drop off? Does that mean I need to change? Like, like what are the common events that you need your customers to report to you? Because that could mean they need a change in their policy. I mean, honestly, Carla, any, if you even think you're thinking about it, you just call us. <laughs> I mean, obviously, the, the one where people don't call us is unless there's a bank involved when you add new equipment. Um, obviously, you know, attended, not attending, going 24 hours or even not going 24 hours might save you money. Um, but like, but you know, if you even think something was changed at your insurance company or your search agency you should know about, always call us because we'll give you the, the right answer either way. That's why we do the annual reviews with clients because we ask them about any changes in their business operation. You know, did you start doing deliveries? Uh, are you still attended? Did you change your store hours? Things like that. Okay, so while we're on this subject, I want to, because this was eye-opening to me, and I thought I knew the answer to this, and you all educated me real quickly. Let's talk about Bailey coverage for a minute and what you, what you learned me. 
Like <laughs> you I taught me. Do a Bailey coverage. Okay, so let's that? so let's start there. Uh-huh. Uh, let's tackle <laughs> Bailey coverage, and then let's tackle do we need it and that that conversation. Traditionally, Bailey's was a dry cleaner coverage, and it was the it was it was basically if a if a dry cleaner damaged your property. I think that I know for a fact that's very misunderstood, and that's what you right. educated me on. Is I thought literally until eight, 10 months ago, whenever we met, um, I thought Bailey coverage was covering the, uh, the consumer's garments when they are in my storage. Not so it might, it might, it might. So that's a definite maybe because there's different Bailey's forms and different coverages within the Bailey's forms. Now, most, most general property forms, the business person or property would include customers stuff that's in your possession at the time as property coverage. Again, under the definition of business personal property, it say, oh, one of the definitions are uh, goods that you don't own but are in your care, custody, and control. Okay. So uh, that you're holding for for you want to hold would be at that time considered business personal property. So that would fall into the same category of business personal property. It's uh, you want you all have seen my operation, right? I mean, you didn't see third shift, but you've seen our store. And so you yeah. understand that at any one night in just one store, uh, we have 2,000, 1,500 to 2,500 pounds of customers' yeah. goods. They, they come in one day and they go back out the next day. If our store right. burned, burned out, I mean, I, I don't think it's crazy to extrapolate that out, out and call that twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 probably in retail value. But if I only had $10,000 in coverage, then I wouldn't have enough coverage, even though I might think I did because I had a Bailey coverage? Right. Under that scenario, you don't need ba- Bailey's. So you're uh, right. It, it would be covered under the business threshold property limit. So we right. make sure that you have enough for that daily amount of clothes coming in and out. So I might think I have coverage because I have Bailey. But what I'm, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, because I have Bailey coverage, but Bailey coverage is actually a waste of money because it's not actually covering what I think it's covering. It's covering me damaging it, not it being damaged in my protector. Right. Then on the flip right. side, if I have business coverage, property coverage, but I have 10,000, but I need 50,000, then I don't have enough. So I'm paying for something I don't need and I'm uh, un- uncovered or what's the word I'm looking for? Improperly covered in the, in the amount that I need and in, in that scenario, I'm literally describing my story a year ago, by the way. I wanted to bring attention to that, not because it's probably going to like bankrupt somebody, but because it could amount to tens of thousands of dollars of lack of coverage just because, or wasted premiums, because you're paying for something you don't need. And the reason I can say, and this isn't to attack people, but there are people in the industry, uh, people selling laundromat insurance in the industry that have flat out explained that to me completely backwards from what you just explained it to me as. And I, because I thought I was knowledgeable, I'm not saying they did it intentionally. Maybe they misunderstand too. I, because I thought I was knowledgeable because this person had explained it to me, have explained it to other people in a way of you need this and no, that's not that. That's not correct. And you've completely corrected that. And we had a pretty in-depth conversation around it because of the amount of laundry we store at any one night. I just want to call attention to, I know I'm a little bit rare in the sense of I prefer to be overinsured. I'd prefer to pay a little bit more in insurance and just that causes me and Carla to sleep really well at night. But it's a little bit unnerving to me, a lot of bit unnerving actually, to think that I've tried for 15 years to be diligent, to work with people that are writing policy specifically for the laundromat industry and, st- and, and it hasn't burned me, but to now understand and be a lot more educated on that one that kudos to you guys because that tells me you are the the powerhouse laundromat brokers that we have learned that you are and that you're very knowledgeable and you're very diligent and you're uh, obsessed and i mean that in a good way with making sure that we have good coverage but i want to call attention to all of our peers out there today that are if you're still listening you're clearly interested uh in this episode that man uh, i think we've given about a thousand reasons of why we shouldn't be shopping price alone, I guess I should say. I'm not saying that price isn't irrelevant. And in the environment we're in today with laundromat insurance, I just think we all need to maybe take a deep breath and be a lot more diligent. And and if that means, you know, I'm a big proponent of raising your prices and things like that. If that means we need to pay more for insurance, 
And we need to find that in our margins by either doing more volume or doing better margins per customer or whatever that looks like. Our business needs to be healthy. But having subpar insurance is, man, that's a dangerous game of roulette, in my opinion. Yeah. I tell this to people when they buy, when they, when they buy houses. Uh, for, most, for most people, your house is your biggest investment. Yeah. Why are you looking for the cheapest insurance to protect your biggest investment? So it's the same thing with your business. True. And most laundromat owners, just I'll just speak in our category, most laundromat owners, and this is the case for us, it's, it's, it's everything. It's our entire life. It's our retirement, it's our cash flow, it's how we live on a day-to-day, it's how we will retire. It's our most valuable asset or assets, uh, certainly asset class. And man, to to do that all to save 1500 bucks, just, you know, I, I think we would all agree that that's probably not a very good strategy. So maybe we need to regroup. And until you until you need insurance, you don't realize how valuable it is. I, you know, I, I, I don't intentionally want to scare people, but I think I do want to kind of shake us a little. Uh, what are your warnings out there for yeah. laundromat owners? Let me touch on work comp really quick. Okay. Two tips on workers comp. One is it doesn't pay to hire uh, people off the books these oh, days. Uh, and number two is the IRS has rules for what is a 1099 and what is an employee. A person who does wash, dry, and fold is not a 1099. They are employees. So if you classify them as a 1099, you're going to get dinged by the IRS, uh, and you may have a work comp issue as well. So be careful about that. We did a whole podcast we, what, on that with ADP mm-hmm. about a contractor versus a W-2 employee. So if you need, if you're listening and you need more on that, go to our episode with ADP. But... If you get hurt at work, there's two questions when you go to the hospital to walk in. Well, you hurt at work is question number one. And do you have insurance? Is question number two. And we've seen, you know, and God forbid there's a, a major injury, which we've seen, unfortunately, over the years. You know, besides dealing with now the workers' comp issue, you can have the labor department and OSHA and, you know, and possibly the IRS when something, you know, that bad goes wrong. And we've, we've seen it happen, you know, at least once over the last 10 years. That's right. Remember, when, when you have a claim, it's the insurance company's job to pay as little as possible. Yeah. Obviously, it's your job to get as much as you think you deserve. But consider this. You have a claim once every 10 years or something like that or five years. You don't know insurance. They handle claims every day. They know insurance. You're at a distinct disadvantage. Yeah. That's why we need the broker, you, that's on our side. <laughs> <laughs> And I'll tie a nice bow around this. That's why we have created the Laundromat Insurance Program. It's why we did it with you all. Uh, We are honored to be your business partners. Uh, Reach out to Larry and Joel. uh, Connect with us at laundromatmillionaire.com backslash insurance. Um, All it is is a contact form. and Get a free quote. They'll take a look at your policy with their vast amount of knowledge on insurance. That's worth it. In itself. And it's completely, your policy. doesn't cost you anything. <laughs> you can do it right now. It, you don't have to be a client. And I can tell you too, they're not high pressure salespeople, which is why we created the partnership with them is because they truly have what we call the heart of a servant, meaning they are looking to help you. And if helping you is telling you the brutal truth of you are underinsured and you may be saving a little money, but this is the risk that you're taking. You know, in business, we're all balancing risk and reward and supply demand and all these different things you you, you just want to you know you want to partner with people that are that have your best intentions at heart people that have been there and done it that own and run laundromats every day that own and insure laundromats every day there's a there's a big difference well thank you guys for being here today for everyone back home i know this was a little bit you know in the weeds a little bit but it's just the nature of the timing of being in the laundromat industry the timing of economic conditions and inflation, and then just insurance companies trying to mitigate their losses, which is what they do. Um, you know, it's a unique time. And so that's why we wanted to have this episode. I will throw one other thing out there. I think in the next few months, maybe the next quarter, uh, we're going to try to get together with Larry and Joel and have a live Q&A on social media uh, where you can log in and you can ask questions. Um, you know, right now you're just kind of being the audience listening to us ask questions And you may have questions of your own regarding your policy or whatever that looks like. You can reach out to us one-on-one through laundermatmillionaire.com backslash insurance and do it one-on-one that way. Or you can, if you want to, before you reach out to us individually, 
you can just join us for that Q&A and we'll be, we'll be glad to see if we can get some answers for you there. Listen, for everyone back home, Dave and Carla Menz here in Cincinnati and our good friends, Larry and Joel, thanks for joining us today. We will see you next time for another episode of the Laundromat Millionaire Show. Take care, everyone. <laughs>